segment, we are here to just give you guys a bit of a brief on corals and coral reefs um, and how important they are to us um, and how important climate change is and how it's affecting those ecosystems. So uh, coral ecosystems are some of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. They are home um, and provide food to about 25% of all of the animals in the ocean. So they're really important for a lot of different fish, um, especially juvenile fish. So reefs are a really good place for fish to come and raise their young or lay their eggs. Um, you can see in the tank we've even got um, two of our clownfish here. The male is the smaller one and they've actually got quite a few eggs there on the rock. Um, and the male's just tending to them and the female's the bigger one. So things like that that are really important to protect um, because down the line when those fish grow up that's when we catch those fish and eat them. Um, so yeah, we just kind of want to learn how to preserve that. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to be telling you a bit about them. Rob's going to be asking some questions. Yeah, so feel free to like throw your questions up to us guys, but we're, we've got a few things here um, that people are interested in. Obviously, you're saying that coral reefs are really important to ecosystems. Um, can you tell us some of the threats uh, of coral reefs around the world? Yeah, so major threats of coral reefs um, are of course overarching climate change, so um, things like the ocean acidification, so um, that's when we've got two high of a pH um, and that makes it really hard for the corals to grow because it dissolves their skeleton. So you can see here I've got a few skeletons of corals. Um, this is a fungidae coral and this is just kind of a little massive coral. Um, and so when the ocean's too acidic it will dissolve their skeletons and then they don't have a place to have their polyp which is this. Um, also things such as um, sea level temperatures rising, so when temperatures get too hot um, there are these small little bits of algae um, called zooxanthellae that live inside of the coral polyps here and they give 90% of the energy um, to corals. So they're the reason that these corals can grow and expand and live, um, but when it gets too hot those zooxanthellae leave the coral polyp and this guy really will struggle to live um, and they event eventually end up dying um, but before that we have what is called bleaching so you guys have probably heard what that is before it's when the corals turn white um, and that's mainly due to rising temperatures in the ocean cool we got a few questions coming through which yeah. is great cool. um, what temperature is the water in this tank oh um in this tank 20 Celsius. And is that about the same uh, as the temperatures we get in the wild? Well, in the wild, um, the temperature can range. So anywhere from 18 degrees Celsius up to 32 degrees Celsius is the optimal range. Um, unfortunately though, if that range goes up one degree or down one degree, it can stress the zooxanthellae again living in the coral polyp and cause them to leave. And another question about the little clownfish behind you. Yes. What color are those eggs? What Let's color are they? Yeah, we'll see if we can zoom in. Um, they're kind of clear actually. So when you're looking really close up, you can see through and you can see the little fish inside um, or the little embryo inside. Um, and they're just hanging out. And you can see the male there. And he's just kind of guarding them and looking after them. Yeah, cool. Uh, and. Where do corals get their color from? Corals get their color from the algae that's living inside them. So algae is photosynthetic, which means it's kind of like a plant. Um, what it does is when the sunlight comes down, the chlorophyll in the plant or in the algae cells um, takes in that sunlight and that's what gives it the color. So you can see there's a wide range of color for corals um, and that's because the photopigments from the zooxanthellae shine through because actually these coral polyps are clear when they don't have the zooxanthellae living inside of them. That's why corals turn white when the zooxanthellae leave and there's coral bleaching because all you're seeing is the remaining skeleton which is made out of calcium carbonate and that is white similar to our bones. And what makes the different shapes of coral? Um, <laughs> well, so I'll just give you a bit of a background story. Corals are kind of uh, the term corals is kind of funny, so uh, 
corals are a colony, is what they are. Each individual is actually a polyp. So one of these is one coral. Um, and these all come together and they make things like the coral colony. So you can see here, all of that is one coral colony. Those are mushroom corals. And then we've got these green ones over here and those are a coral colony. Um, so yeah, it's a clone and these individual polyps clone themselves and that's kind of what makes the structures of them. And uh, are corals um, plants or animals? Or corals? somewhere in between? Oh, good question. Um, corals are animals. So the polyp is an animal and it has tentacles and those come out into the water and they grab other small little um, zooplankton in the water. So little tiny bits of food and they eat those. But again, living inside of the coral's tissue is the zooxanthales, which are a type of algae. And algaes aren't necessarily a plant. They're kind of in their own separate category. And, okay, so Abby wants to know, how corals stay on the, on the ocean floor? Oh, very good question, Abby. Um, so corals attach themselves to a substrate, which is just a structure like a rock. Um, so you can see here, we've got a lot of rocks in this tank and the corals will attach onto it, um, and then that's where they're gonna grow, and they'll build up their calcium skeleton, um, and then you can just see that grow and grow and grow after time, really similar to a tree. So like the tree has roots, and the roots are stuck in the ground, and then that tree, as it grows, it gets more rings, very similar to a coral. And um, where do corals come from initially? How do they reproduce? Um, very good question. So corals have two life stages. Um, there is a larval stage and a sessile sta stage. So um, right here you can see the sessile stage where they're um, laying on the, or attached to the substrate, so they're stuck in one spot. Um, but how corals reproduce is they will spawn. So that means they'll release the sperm and the egg into the water and then those sperm and egg will come together and then eventually settle on a rock and then that's when the coral polyp will start to grow. Cool, and how do, given that corals are animals, how do they breathe in the water? Mm. So corals, um, they, they breathe in the dissolved oxygen that the zooxanthellae give out. So because zooxanthellae are algae, they take in CO2 so things like, you know, when we drive our cars, we put CO2 into the air, and then that gets dissolved into the water, um, so like in here, and then the calcium, or sorry, the CO2 in the water is taken up by the zooxanthelles, and they um, pop out oxygen, like plants do, um, and then so that oxygen is dissolved in the water. So you might be able to see little bubbles on the surface around this tank, um, so sim something similar to that, and the corals take that dissolved oxygen in. Okay. Um, how long do corals live for? Oh, good question. Um, corals can live for decades, centuries. Um, there's even some deep sea corals that they have found to live for 4,000 years. So they can last quite a while. Well, that's pretty old. Yeah, it's pretty old. <laughs> Almost as old as Rob. Oh, I'm not sure how I feel about that from behind the camera. <laughs> um, what kind of animals uh, rely on coral to survive? Um, a lot of animals, so including us, including humans. Um, a lot of larger fish um, will have their offspring on coral reefs and they'll grow up there, the little babies, um, and then once they're big enough and they've grown nice and strong, then they'll go out into the open ocean. We rely on coral reefs for a lot of reasons. So again, because one, they produce a lot of the food that we consume um, in fish. So again, they're breeding grounds. Also, um, we rely on them for tourism. Um, I think that they're, in terms of an economic standpoint, worth tens of billions of dollars, US dollars um, a year. So they're really important to our economy, um, really important culturally as well to us. So yeah, they've got a lot of uses for a lot of animals. Um, and then 
in homes, you know, in coral reefs, they have a lot of anemones on them as well, which are, you know, some people's favorites, and anemones are home to clownfish. Um, we've also just got a lot of other sea stars and things like sea cucumbers that live in and amongst coral reefs. This here is a giant clam. Um, you can see it's got these little fans coming out. Um, so yeah, they live on coral reefs, so there's lots And um, you've spoken quite a bit about the threats to coral reefs. Um, what can we do to help coral reefs? So some easy things you guys can all do to help coral reefs is just try and be as environmentally friendly as possible. So try not to pollute. Um, you know, it's always good to pick up rubbish on the beaches when you see it. Um, when you go and go snorkeling or swimming or scuba diving, you want to be cautious of where you're kicking, not to break corals or sponges or other life kind of hanging around in the areas you're exploring. Also, um, to, you know, just even things like reef-proof sunscreen. So a lot of the times um, there's a lot of things going into the water that can affect the balances that allow these corals to grow. So things like your sunscreen. Um, so you can get some really good environmentally friendly sunscreen. Also reducing your carbon footprint, that's a huge one, especially for climate change, which is the theme of this um, Earth Day, is climate action. So, you know, taking your bike out more instead of the car, or carpooling, using the buses. Um, so yeah, those are a few things you can do. Okay, and like, obviously we see quite a lot of variety, like even just in this small tank behind us. Um, what a what are some of the different types of corals that we're likely to see on coral reefs? Oh, on coral reefs, you've got tons of different types. There's thousands of species. Um, you've got two kind of categories of corals. So you've got soft ones and hard corals. Um, soft corals, a few examples are the ones kind of behind me here. So again, we've got the mushroom corals. And then these are dunking corals, the one with all those little wiggly guys coming out. Those are its tentacles. And then something like an example of a hard coral would be one of these um, massive stony corals over here. So um, we've also got branching corals, so ones that look like horns on a deer. Um, those are quite common, especially around reefs. You can have table corals, which are really flat, um, and they can get really big. They can get as wide as I am tall, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and how big can corals get? Corals can get pretty big if they have the opportunity to grow. Um, I've personally seen some corals as wide in diameter as I am tall. I'm five foot three, which is I think 163 centimeters. Um, so yeah, they can get quite big. You can also have really small corals. So um, you know things just as big as this, which is this is actually a single polyp. It's a fungidae coral. We've got some smaller ones here, but as you can see in the tank, we've got far bigger ones as well. And um, obviously, coral is uh, makes a nice home for things, and, and it's good at producing oxygen and things like that. Um, are there species of animals that eat coral or rely on it as a food source? Um, yeah, there. I think the, ooh, there are a few different fish species that eat coral. Um, I think parrotfish are one of them hear them chomping on coral when you are scuba diving, which is pretty cool. Um, or the blue grouper, he also is going around and eating algae off um, sponge gardens and coral gardens, um, definitely around temperate Sydney areas. So yeah, definitely species that eat them. Uh, and I know in the past we have uh, heard about some organisms like the crown of thorns starfish. Um, Chuck would like to know if the crown of thorns are still a big issue on the reef. Crown of thorns are still a big issue on the reef. Um, unfortunately, they eat um, coral really quickly um, and they reproduce really quickly as well. So um, that is an ongoing issue. There's a lot of research being done about crown of thorns starfish. Um, we actually have a few crown of foreign starfish here at Sydney Sea Life Aquarium, um, which is interesting. And hopefully through further research, we can understand how to better deal with them and manage them on reefs. Um, so then that way they don't also endanger um, corals along with the other many threats that they face. 
Queen, we have a uh, clam-related question now. Oh, yeah. How big can giant clams grow? Oh, giant clams can get huge. So, um... Some might say giant. Giant. Um, there are giant tridactic clams, which are really old, um, and so they can get massive. I've seen some that are as big as me, um, and there's quite a few up on Orpheus Island. There's a big clam garden there, so if you Google that, um, you might be able to see those. Um, so yeah, this guy is pretty big right now, um, but I reckon he could get a whole lot bigger. Uh, and obviously when we think about coral reefs, we often think about the tropics uh, and places like the Great Barrier Reef and Ningaloo Reef uh, in Australia. Uh, are there coral reefs um, further south? And uh, Sarah Jane asked specifically, are, are there coral reefs in Sydney? There are corals in Sydney. Um, not necessarily large reefs like you would see like this. Um, corals in Sydney tend to be more um, isolated from one another, so single corals um, just kind of hanging around. But yeah, there's a lot of different types of corals, and what we would call the corals we find around Sydney are temperate water corals, so colder water corals. Um, they can just deal with the colder conditions we have here in Sydney mo er, during this part of the year. Cool. Um... Obviously, uh, in the wild, um, corals, uh, like you said, get a lot of their energy from the zooxanthellae via the sun. Um, how do we replicate that in a situation like this, um, in, in, in a tank? Yeah, so this tank is set up, so this is kind of a, its own little reef environment, its own little reef ecosystem. Um, so here we've got, um, you can't see them, but up above this wall behind here, we've got a bunch of really big lights, um, and these lights act as the sun. So kind of like if you have a pet lizard and you have one of those big lamps at home, it's kind of like a heat lamp, it's a source of sunlight for them as well. Um, so that's how we help the zooxanthellae um, thrive in these conditions. Also, you'll see we've got a lot of ripples here on the top of the water. Um, we've got a lot of flow set up in this tank. That's also really important, especially for soft corals. You want a lot of uh, movement kind of around the water to keep things not so stagnant. Um, and you know, there are tentacles kind of flowing around, which is good and really important. Um, and then we've got a lot of other fish in here as well. So those fish are really important to the balance in this tank. They go around and they eat algae growing on the corals or on the rocks around the corals. Um, so it's a very good relationship because we've got, you know, the corals providing homes to certain fish um, or anemones providing certain homes to fish and then in return those fish are kind of going around and making um, things nice and clean and tidy for the corals and giving them plenty of room. Yeah. Cool. Now uh, the clam has sparked some interest. Ah, oh, cool. Uh, so do you know, can clams move? Um, not one like this, so I don't, I don't believe so. Um, I know that the giant tridactic clams, what they do is they bore themselves, so they kind of almost uh, dig a hole in a rock and they situate themselves into that hole and then they stay there. Um, and what happens is they actually kind of melt the rock away with a special chemical that they secrete. Um, so those types of clams do not move, they pick a spot and they stay there. Um, so hopefully it's a good spot because they're there for the rest of their lives. Um, but some clams, smaller clams like um, you know, the mussels and stuff like that, those can move around um, a bit more, or like uh, scallops. They're not really a clam, but they can move around. Um, which is cool. Yeah, so things like, obviously we do get things like scallops uh, on the reef. Um, how do scallops move? Well, obviously something like that looks like a you know, big shell, it doesn't have legs or anything. How, how does something like that happen? Yeah, so scallops move, um, I believe it's just by taking water in and then shooting it out. So they move their shell up and down like this, and then when they do that they propel themselves back. Um, the videos of scallops moving are really funny actually, so if you, maybe we can upload one later on our Facebook or something so you guys can see what that looks like. Oh, uh, this, this is really important, this one. The 23rd Hamilton Guides from Ontario in Canada oh. say hi. 
Hi. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> I, spoke, I think they should all be asleep, shouldn't they? Yeah, right? what time is it? No, no, it's only about like 8 o'clock in Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah, 8 p.m. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, also, um, more questions on clams. What, what do clams eat? Are they like coral? Do they get their food from the sun or do they need to eat real food? They are um, similar to corals. So you can see that the clam here has got some pink colouring to it. Clams do have zooxanthellae living inside of them, so they do have that photosynthetic algae. Um, but clams also have a big siphon in them, so... Um, well, let's see if we can get up close and close. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the siphon. It's just back there. It's glory. kind of like a little, I don't know, hole sticking out. That's um, the glory shot right there. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the <laughs> glory shot. Um, <laughs> and so what they do is they suck water in and it goes through kind of a filtration system. Oh, you can see that, I think they've just been fed. Oh, you can see all the fish. Ben is just fed um, in this tank. Seagrass can see some um, small artemia, a little shrimp he's dumping in. And the fish are just going crazy. So what happens is when they put the food in, the clam will suck water in, and that water is going to have food particles in the water. And then it's going to filter out that food and then siphon the water back out um, into the water column. Similar to how corals have their tentacles, so these guys right here on the polyp, and they wave those around in the water, and they grab the food and bring it and put it into their mouths. Okay, Olivia has a great question. She wants to know if corals are hard or soft. Both. There are two different types of corals. Um, main category is hard and soft. Um, so oh, here's a soft coral right here. Look. Yeah, these are all soft corals. These are dunking corals. You can see the clam is shut now because they're really sensitive. So if you wave your hand over them, they'll close up. Um, that's kind of cool. But yeah, so these are all soft corals. And then over here, next to the clam, we've got a big hard coral. Um, but the hard corals still kind of do look soft and squishy. That's because the polyp coming out of the skeleton is actually kind of um, you know, squishy, an anemone feel. Oh, here's a question for you. These Canadians have some questions. <laughs> One of them would like to know if fish can feel earthquakes. Ah, oh, good thing. I am also a geologist along as a marine scientist. I would assume yes. Um, yes, they can feel earthquakes. I don't know if it bugs them as much as it bugs us, but... Maybe that'll be a question further on in life when we can officially <laughs> communicate with fish. Officially communicate. Officially. <laughs> um, can corals uh, carry diseases? Um, yes, corals can get sick. Um, they can't really, I don't think they can, I'm not sure 100% if they can give you a disease per se, um, but they can get sick. Coral bleaching is a type of sickness. Um, so, because they're not actually dead when the coral is bleached, um, that just means they're highly stressed and then they're very, um, it's very easy for them to then die from that. Uh, a couple of people are obviously tuning in late and they've missed some of the information early on, so we might go for a bit of revision. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Quickly, are, are corals animals, vegetables or other? Vegetables. <laughs> they're not vegetables. Um, corals are animals. Um, but like I was saying earlier, so what you've got is this polyp and it lives inside of a skeleton made out of calcium carbonate. This is the animal right here. It's got the tentacles coming out, but inside of the tissue of this animal we have algae. So a zooxanthellae um, and it's a photosynthetic um, organism and that gives 90% of the energy coral will use um, to the polyps. And also we've got those coral skeletons there. What are the skeletons made of? Ah, yes. These are made out of um, calcium carbonate. So we've got a few different types here. This is a fungidae coral. Um, so this is a single polyp. So like I was saying earlier, um, we've got lots of little polyps and these are all clones and that makes up a coral colony. Um, but this here is just a single polyp. So these are kind of cool. We've got a few of them in this tank as well. Um, and so yeah, uh, these guys are just made out of calcium carbonate, similar to your bones. And what would have been in here is the soft tissue that the coral would have been coming out of with its tentacles. Any other 
questions? Oh, here's a really hard one. Okay. <laughs> How many species of fish live on the reef? How many species? Oh, many, many, many species. My marine science professor would be just disappointed in me, but I do not remember. Um, there are a lot of species, and there's actually quite a few different species depending on where you're at in the world. So we've got the Coral Triangle, which is the area in which we have our Great Barrier Reef, um, and those species are quite a bit different to the species you would find over in um, the Caribbean, so in North and Central America. So lots of different species, um, and it's all kind of dependent upon currents, which is interesting. So we find certain species because those currents in the water movement will move the larva of the fish around um, and settle them in certain areas, and so that's why we mainly find certain species in certain areas. That was a good question. That was a hard one. Yeah, yeah. Um, related to a previous question, do you think that fish would feel tsunamis? As yes. Well as <laughs> Who's asking these ones? Uh, people are just trying to stump you. I yeah, I reckon they are. Um, I've not yeah. been asking them really hard ones. I'm, I imagine that they would feel the tsunamis. Um, in fact, reefs are really important. Um, that's another. That's another thing I forgot to mention earlier, and why reefs are important to us as well. Um, they protect our coastline so much from things like cyclones. So up in Queensland, we've got the Great Barrier Reef, and that protects these huge storm waves that come in, um, which prevents erosion on our coastline. So here in Sydney, back in 2016, we had that massive erosion event um, that destroyed, unfortunately, a lot of you know beaches that everyone goes to, and some homes as well. Um, so things like coral reefs protect our beaches and therefore protect us because in Australia alone about 82% of the population lives within a certain kilometre radius from the oceans. So we all live quite close to them. Um, so it's important to make sure that you know, those areas are safe for us to live. Um, Benjamin would like to know uh, that you mentioned that when bleaching occurs um, that the coral's still alive but just stressed. Yes. Um, how do you know when a coral is dead? Uh, when a coral is fully dead, um, it will easily break off. Um, it will still be white in colour because the polyps will not be there anymore. Um, but you can tell because if a coral still has the polyps coming out, so the little tentacle bits coming, um, so you know, like you can see around here. Um, see the tissue on them even when they're clear and bleached you can still kind of see that tissue layer on them but when they're fully dead they won't have anything so like these yeah. guys there's nothing but bone left so so we've just got a frame up quite nicely here where you can see in the background uh, is the live coral and in the front right here is the skeleton that we've been looking at oh. and so you can see the skeleton there has no flesh on it back up here in the tank you can see that kind of pink spongy flesh yeah, if that cool. coral was bleached that would all still be there but be white so you know when it's dead is when you no longer have that flesh uh, on the skeleton you're just left with those bony chalky white skeletons yeah. well, we're, getting a, we're getting a lot of love oh cool thanks guys <laughs> benjamin says Lots thank you Benjamin. Oh, we missed your love heart. Oh, love heart. Oh, romance. We love the ring. We love the ring. <laughs> okay, we're probably winding up now, so just uh, if we can reiterate, uh, what are the key points to what makes a coral, but also what can we do to make sure that coral's still going to be there for future generations? So, key points about corals, um, they're not plants, they're animals. They're really important to us because they provide a lot of economic value, cultural value to us, um, also food. Um, they support a huge diversity of animals. Um, so, you know, like I said, 25% of all marine life is supported by coral reefs. Um, and so, yeah, it's really important to protect them, not only for our, our sake, but also for the many other species in the world that we love to look at and we're interested in and we want to learn about. Um, and so things that you can all do at home is firstly being educated so you guys are all tuning in today and you're learning a bit about them. You can now go and tell some of your friends about it um, and you can you know, remember to use 
reef safe sunscreen when you go swimming or snorkeling and when you are scuba diving or snorkeling or doing those fun activities around reefs just be sure to be mindful um, you know you don't want to be standing on corals and breaking them because they do take so long to grow um, also things like just trying to reduce your carbon footprint um, because Climate change is a really big thing that is affecting coral reefs and the rising ocean temperatures. So maybe, you know, take your bicycle out um, or run to work or walk and yeah, things like that. Okay, time for one final question. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite kind of fish? What's my favorite fish? Ooh, um, that's a hard one. My, it's not a fish, it's an Alaskan barong. I love sharks, um, so I would pick uh, a favorite Sharks are fish. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't put them in the same category. But, um, <laughs> oh. I do really like clownfish. Oh, really there we go. How yeah. convenient. There's and I love their little babies. Clownfish with the little itty bitty baby eggs. Yeah. Thanks everyone for watching. And Thank just you. a reminder we have a 24 uh, 7 live stream of our giant barrier reef tank, uh, which you can get to via our website. So please check that out. Okay, bye. Bye.